In the world of seven billion people, the most frequent question that everyone asks is their life after death. Almost every human being is bothered few times in his life thinking what's going to be in the, in the day after. Once I will move and transfer to another world, will I become sent and it will be over? Or actually there will be continuation to my spirit. In many surveys throughout the world, many people answer more than 70% of the people that they believe there is an afterlife. The question that we have to ask, and this is what we're going to focus on in this film, can it be proven scientifically? We're going to speak in two different fields, one in the scientific according to parapsychology, and one according to Judaism, according to the Jewish Torah, which was given to the Jewish people 3,323 years ago. Millions of Jews were standing around Mount Sinai when Moses spoke to God. Millions of them heard the voice of God for the first and last time in history. That Torah that was given to the Jews in front of millions of witnesses has transferred from generation to generation throughout the entire world. And there are many, many communities in the world today that are still holding the same original text of the Torah as exactly it was given to Moses in front of the nation of Israel. In the Jewish Torah, we have many indications and proofs that God spoke about the existence of the soul once it's transferred to the afterlife, to the spiritual life. We're going to focus on different parts of the written and the oral Torah and also according to the Kabbalah, which is the mystical part of Judaism. And we combine it together with all the discoveries of the last 30 years of many parapsychologists, cardiologists, doctors, etc. Uh, we actually going to skip from one part to the other just to put everything together to clarify the picture to every person that has a doubt by the end of this film I believe any doubt whatsoever will be dismissed just 100% in the beginning of the Torah in the book of Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 God is describing how he created the first human being, Adam. This is the first person that was created directly by God. He wasn't born to a woman. And God collected sand from the ground and created the image of the body and he blew into his nostrils a living soul. Only after the soul was given, the person, Adam, was able to move, to talk, to walk, and to act in a spiritual manner. And if we continue to review the Tanakh, the Bible, in the book of Kohelet, King Solomon, chapter uh, 12, verse 7, this is how it describes the time of death. And the body will return to the ground, that's where it came from, and the spirit will return to the master who gave it. So, obviously, once the spirit, the soul, leaves the physical body, the body falls into the ground, and return into the ground in a period of about 11 months in the grave and only the skeleton remains no more flesh, no more ligaments, no muscles, nothing whatsoever and the spirit returns back to the spiritual upper world there are two transactions here one, the creation of mankind and one, transferring him into the afterlife, into the spiritual world is something like that can be uh, proven scientifically, we're going to see in a few minutes. In the Oral Torah, which is the actually an integral part of the written Torah, came with the Oral Law. What does it mean, an Oral Law? God did not write all his rules and all his information in one book. The short version of the Torah, which basically mentioning the 613 commandments that a, a Jew has to keep in his life, in this life of a test that he lives in this world. It's 248 positive commandments, 365 restrictions. 
And the body of a human being is a combination of 365 ligaments, 248 organs. For every organ in the body, there is a positive commandment. 248 organs, 248 commandments. For every ligament, there is a restriction in the Torah. 365 ligaments, 365 restrictions, and this is basically the image of the soul. The soul looks exactly like the body without material. If you try to grab something, you won't feel anything. But the image of the soul, it's a spiritual image, is exactly like the body looks. Uh, when it comes to the number of organs and ligaments in the body, there's different ways to break them down. So the Mishnah, which is a part of the oral law, is breaking it 100% from 1 to 613 altogether, you know, pieces from the fingers, from the, from the hands, from the joints, uh, internal parts of the stomach, one by one it comes to 613. So all together this is the image of the body and of course this is the image of the soul. So the oral Torah is all the explanation of the 613 commandments, the restrictions and the positive commandments, all the secrets, all the explanation, how to fulfill this commandment, all was given to Moses verbally and he came down from the mountain after 40 days he was in Mount Sinai and he transferred all the divine information that he received from the creator of the world, was giving it to the Jewish nation, showing them, practicing with them. With a period of 40 years, every Jew among the Hebrews, among the Jewish nation, was able to function 100% according to the Book of God. As part of the oral law, this is what we call today the Talmud. The Talmud, or what we call in Hebrew the Gemara, which is commentaries about the Mishnah, about the Talmud. It was written eventually approximately 2,000 years ago. For a period of 1,300 years, there was a restriction to write it down. Later, when the second temple in Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans and the Jews were sent to the exile, the president of Israel at that time, Rabbi Judah, the president, was afraid that we're going to lose the oral part of the Torah which will dismiss Judaism completely. So he wrote the oral Torah, even though it was forbidden up to that moment. And that's what we call today the Mishnah. We're still learning it for the past 2,000 years all over the world. As a part of the oral law, this is how the Torah explains the creation of mankind. Three partners in the creation of mankind. God, his father, and his mother. His father contribute the material that creates the bones, the ligaments, the nails, the brain inside the head, the white inside the eyes, and the mother contribute the material who creates the skin, the flesh, the hair, the pupils inside the eyes, and God contribute the spirit, the soul, the image of the face, the ability to see, the ability to hear, the ability to talk and to walk, the wisdom the intellect, and the intelligence. Once the time came for a person to leave this physical world, comes God and take his share and leave what his father and mother contributed and obviously the person falls and die and finishes uh, life in this planet. This is a description of how a person is created and eventually when God comes, takes his share, which is the soul and the spirit, comes out of the body, then a person cannot walk, cannot hear, cannot talk, cannot remember, and basically cannot function. And as I mentioned before, there are 613 commandments and believe it or not, three of them is a direct, clear requirement not to communicate with the deceased people. If God, by giving the Torah to millions of Jews, commanded them that they are not allowed to communicate with any person who passed away from the world, right away we understand that there is such an ability. If God told us, do not bother the dead people, do not ask them any question, do not communicate with them, Right the way I understand, obviously there's a way to do it. If I do not know how to do it technically, it doesn't mean it's not possible. So if God told me, do not communicate with them, that means I have a way to do it. 
How many different ways, three different ways to communicate with the deceased people? According to the language of the Torah, the ancient Hebrew, this is how it sounds. Lo shoel Three different ways. First one, in Hebrew it's called shoel of. Second one, nidoni. And the third one is doresh elametim. This is in Deuteronomy 18, verse 10 to 11. Right there, over there, God said to the Jews, I forbid each one of you from disturbing the deceased people and asking them any questions. There are three ways to do it. Today we use a modern language. We use the word medium. Uh, there are ways, uh, what we call Ouija board, to communicate with souls of people who passed away from the world. There's uh, other ways to do it today, and we use the different terms, but actually this is exactly what the Torah was referring to. So, in the book of Yov, Yov was a Gentile prophet, he wasn't Jewish, but he was a holy man, a very righteous man, who suffered a large part of his life, and the book that he wrote with the uh, divine inspiration is an integral part of the Tanakh, of the 24 books of Judaism. And right there it says, Or uvasar talbisheni, skin and flesh is my alphet, uvatsamot vegidim tesochecheni, and you covered me with bones and ligaments. So basically, in that case, who am I? If my alphet is the flesh and the skin and the bones and the ligaments, what's left in me? Who am I? The answer, of course, later we will understand that I am 100% a spiritual, divine soul that was pushed into my body and makes the body able to move and to function. We're going to uh, review it shortly. So, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 2, this is what it says, from the human being that has a soul in his nostrils. As in Genesis, the beginning of the Torah, it's described that God pushed the soul into the nostrils of Adam and only after that he was able to speak, to function, to remember things, to understand things, his intelligence started to function and his wisdom and all the parts of the body started to move uh, simultaneously obviously so we are seeing that actually the master of the body is the soul who is able to move every part of the body and as we continuing the Gemara, the Oral Torah, in the chapter of Nida, this is a chapter who speaks about the impurity of a Jewish woman after she gets her monthly period. She has to wait a few days until all the blood disappears from the body and then wait seven more days and go into the natural water, spring water or rain water, and that purifies the body. We are not talking about clean body, we're talking about spiritually pure. A body can be dirty, but pure. A body can be very clean, but impure. So we are talking about a spiritual term here. So this is one of the laws that applies to a Jewish woman. And uh, over there in, a, in page 30, in a chapter of Nida, it's explained about how the baby is in his mother womb. And this is what the Gemara says. A baby has like a spiritual candle above him and gives him the ability to review the entire world spiritually, like a vision, a spiritual vision. And there's an angel who teaches him the entire Torah. The Torah is wider than the ocean, it's very, very large. The angel is teaching him every, everything. And then just before he comes out to the world, he tap on his top lip and makes him forget everything he learns. Of course, everything stays in his subconscious. And he goes out, and now the mission of life, as a, as a major part of the test of life, is for a Jew to review and learn the Torah. The more he learns, the more uh, higher spiritual level he can reach. And uh, this is basically one of the main tests in life of a person, to be able to be righteous and close to God, is to be knowledgeable in his Torah. The more knowledgeable a person is, automatically he knows the rules and he knows what violations not to violate and what commandments to practice and to do it in a correct way. And according to Kabbalah, 500 years ago there was a legendary Kabbalist, the biggest in the last 2000 years since the Holy Zohar, uh, the, the foundation of Kabbalah was written by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai in the land of Israel. 
uh, one major student, his name was the Ari, the holy Ari that lived 500 years ago in Israel, in the city of Tzfat. He had a major student, his name was Rabbi Chaim Vital, and everything we know from the Ari comes from his student who was writing every word who came out of his mouth. And this is what he writes. The body of a human being is not the person itself. This is only the flesh, the skin, the body of a person. As the Torah referred to the body, the Torah called it basar, the flesh, but not the human being himself. So obviously the human being himself is something more internal. And the body is only the alphabet, just like when a tailor prepares a suit into a person's body. And here God is prepared an alphabet which will cover the soul, the divine soul, which is inside the body, technically, to be more precise, is in the brain. The place where the soul is, is in the brain. And once the time for a person come to leave the world, the soul exit the body, goes up to heaven, to the, to the court of heaven, to the spiritual world, and received a new outfit. It would look exactly like the image of a person, how he lived here, but without any material. There's no material over there. It's 100% spiritual. In the Hebrew term for that, it's called Chaluka de Rabbanan, a special uh, a kilt, spiritual kilt, to put the soul inside once the soul exits the physical world and go to the spiritual world. And we going to continue now, and we're going to speak now about five different ways to prove there's life after death. Five different ways. First one, it's called clinical death, out of body experience. The second one called seance, which is communicating with the deceased people through a medium, which is a third party, a middleman who has spiritual abilities uh, to be able to communicate with people who passed away from the world. We'll give you example of famous mediums in the past. The third way to prove it, it's called reincarnations, which means there is a concept that the soul exits one body and comes back again to this physical world in a new body. Technically, it's exactly the same soul who died 10, 20, 30 years ago, and now it returns back into the world in a new body, a new physical image, but exactly the same soul who come to continue the test from where it left in the last life in previous life. The fourth way to prove it, it's called regression. By hypnotizing a person, hypnosis, it's a very strong way to prove that there are reincarnation, there is life after death, the soul remains somewhere and returns back to this world sometimes, sometimes yes, sometimes no, but the soul definitely does not die. And once uh, we make a regression with a person, we are able to transfer him back in time even to times before he was born in this uh, present life of him, of him. So the fifth way, it's called Dibukim. This is a very unique way. Once in a while, it's a very, very rare uh, phenomena that a person, just like you and I, that is normal living in this world, receiving another soul into his body, which means up to now he had one soul, and at one moment in his life, something happened, we're going to explain what. Uh, another soul entered the body, he did not invite that soul, he did not wish to have two souls in his body, but another human being without a body entered the same body and now there are two souls, which is very similar to a, one plane with two pilots. Each one is trying to grab to his own direction, one is trying to turn the plane to the left, one is trying to turn it to the right, Obviously, the one who is stronger, is more dominant, he will de decide where the planes will aim to. And this is exactly now two souls. The one who takes control of the vocals, he is the one who speaks. And then the other one can speak. And sometimes you see two different voices, two different accents, sometimes two different languages. Sometimes male and female in the same body. As I say, this is a very, very rare phenomena. And we have... Uh, books in the last few hundred years who describe few of the famous Dibukim that happened to people in the past and how the rabbis were able to remove those, these extra soul out of the body according to the secrets of Kabbalah 
And this is the five ways that we're going to prove that there is definitely life after death. And when I say proof, we mean 100% proof. If we're still left with a doubt, even though we improve our faith and belief, it's still not satisfying us enough because we want to reach knowledge, not believing. Believing means not knowing. We want to get to 100% knowledge that when the time comes for us to leave this world, everyone according to his time, we are not going to actually die. Only the body will die, but the soul will remain and something is going to happen to the soul which we're going to describe soon exactly what. Uh, today, one of the most famous debate and argument throughout the world in the last uh, few decades is what's considered the time of death. Believe it or not, this is a question that many, many intellectuals are arguing about for a long, long time. It's in the Supreme Court of United States, in the Supreme Court of Israel, and in other countries. It's among the rabbis, it's among different religions. Many are arguing when exactly is the second that a person is considered 100% death. Some would claim that when their brain dies. Some would claim when a person cannot breathe. Some would claim that when a person's heart stop beating. There are different arguments when exactly we can say that this person is dead and of course there are legal issues relates to it. But one thing, everyone agree, if there are five symptoms simultaneously in this individual, then everyone agree that is considered 100% dead. If not all five symptoms are there, there are arguments when exactly we can say for sure that he died. Different kinds of opinions. Where this debate comes from, what's the root of the argument? The answer is that according to the Torah, which was given more than 3,300 years ago, the Torah was describing the time of death in a very simple manner. The Torah says a person that is able to breathe is alive. Once he cannot breathe anymore, within a minute or two, of course, he died. There's no debate, no argument. Everybody understands this person is dead. And that's the end of the argument. The problem is that today there is all kinds of artificial ways to revive a person. There are all kinds of advanced machines and equipment. Uh, we give the person oxygen. We have all kinds of things to affect his brain and his heart. Uh, all kinds of ways to extend life. That's where really the arguments begin. Is this person considered already dead that we are reviving artificially, therefore is considered dead legally? Or since, after all, you know, he's still breathing, or even though with the help of the equipment, uh, we cannot declare him as a dead person. That's why there's different kinds of opinion, different kinds of arguments. But one thing everyone agrees, as I said, once all five symptoms exist in a person, everyone would sign on his death certificate with no hesitation. What are the five symptoms? The first one is, no brain waves. The brain does not function anymore. The equipment show us no brain waves. Second, the cells of the brain do not receive any oxygen. Up to now, it was receiving constantly oxygen, and no more oxygen is supplied into the brain from the lung. The third symptom is no uh, heart beating. The heart stopped working. No heartbeat, no pulse. That's the third symptom. Later, a few minutes later, a drop in the body temperature. The body, the temperature of a body which is about 38 degrees Celsius uh, or 98 Fahrenheit, all of a sudden, a minute or two later, begin to drop another degree and another degree. And obviously, we touch the person, we feel that he's much colder than before. And the, the fifth symptom is no feelings. A person, you can pinch him, you can burn him, you can cut him. The nerve system is not functioning, no feelings, it does not feel anything. Once those five symptoms exist in one individual, then we will know 100% that he's dead. When five symptoms occur to one person, what are the odds that this person will return back to life? So according to science, according to the medical world, if a person has those five symptoms simultaneously more than six minutes, even if he will return to life, 
a miracle will happen and this person will come back to life, he will be permanently brain damaged for the rest of his life. His memory will be wiped out and many other things there's no way to correct. But believe it or not, every rule in creation has an exception to the rule. We understand that part from different fields. But today, the exception of the rule seems to become a rule by itself. And to have this, this breath of freedom was amazing to me. I didn't care where it was. It was better than where I had just been. It was almost like an abyss, a nothing. Uh, nirvana, if you want to put it. No, I know, I, I just, I know I crossed over. Danian Brinkley, Tim Spinnard, Kimberly Thompson, three people who believe they left their bodies, transcended the boundaries of time and space, and traveled to a place they feel is heaven. There are many, many people, many thousands of people in the world that were declared completely dead for more than six minutes. And later they return back to life even after 40 minutes and even after hours. And they came back to normal life rem rem remembering 100% everything that happened to them before the accident or before the heart attack and what's happening right now. They recognize people and there's no permanent brain damage. Very difficult for the doctors to explain how something like this is possible because it's obviously an exception to the rule, but it's a fact. More than 30 million people reported in the world that they died and they returned to life. Some of them less than six minutes, some of them more than six minutes. A friend of mine was driving, she hit a fire hydrant, and I went through the windshield of the car, but I experienced it from the back seat. I watched myself go leave the front seat and go through the windshield. Fantastic reports made even more baffling to experts because the people who come forward have absolutely nothing to gain and much to lose in revealing their intimate and often embarrassing encounters. In the United States alone, more than 8 million people reported clinical death out of body experience. The soul came out of the body, they were able to see the room, the place of the accident, and later they returned back into the body and came back to normal physical life. This is only the amount of people who bother to go to their doctor and report that what happened to them last night. Many people do not bother. They just see that something strange happened and they move on with their life. So obviously the numbers are much, much more than 30 million, but even 30 million is more than enough to base our proof on. Let's move on. I'm going to use the most famous names in the parapsychology world people who spend more than 20 years of their life every day, every hour in hospital reviewing people who died and came back to life, interviewing doctors, cardiologists, heart doctors, and writing books and articles to conclude the, what they found in their research. One of the most famous one, Dr. Raymond Moody, a psychiatrist from Virginia University, interviewed 150 people who died and came back to life and concluded his discoveries in a book uh, that called The Life After Life was translated to 30 different languages. A very, very bestseller of Dr. Raymond Moody. And uh, another famous psychologist, uh, Dr. Carlos Osis is from the American Union of Psychology, interview 877 different doctors who testified what happened to their patients when they die and later came back to life and published his uh, uh, discoveries in the book, The Time of Death, and many, many articles about this issue. Another famous one, Dr. Kenneth Ring, as a psychologist, a professor from uh, Connecticut University, uh, research and, and interview 102 patients that died and came back to life. Published his book, The Life in the Death. Dr. George Ritchie, uh, the president of Richmond Academy of Medicine and the head of the psychiatry uh, 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 the psychiatry unit of Towers Hospital. He uh, wrote a book, The Return from the Tomorrow, which he concluded all his discovery in all the research that he had about this subject. 
Doctor, the most famous in the world today, Dr. Elizabeth Kobler-Ross from Detroit, a world-known psychiatrist. Uh, more than 20 years she dedicated every day of her life to interview and discover and do all kinds of researches about people who died and returned to life. She published many books about time and death and uh, many articles. She's known as very, very famous uh, a specialist in this uh, subject and we're going to see their discovery soon and then of course we're going to combine it together with what the Jewish Torah had to say from 3,300 years ago and we find a beautiful match that everything that the scientific world is discovering basically the Torah already knew in a very very primitive generation more than 3,300 years ago. Dr. Morris Rowlings, a cardiologist from Tennessee University interview 300 patients who died and came back to life and published a book beyond beyond the point of death. Dr. Fran Schoonmaker, a cardiologist from Denver Hospital, interviewed more than a thousand cases of people who died and were able to come back to life and of course he has a lot to say about his discoveries. There are many more, we don't need all the parapsychologists in the world, it's enough, we use 10 of the best ones in the world and exactly we have to listen to everything they discover it's they bringing scientific proofs that leaves no doubt that actually in the time of death their real life begins as I said more than 30 million people had that experience and when they were interviewed we find that they all have mutual elements to report they speaking about the same experiences that they had, it's amazing because we are talking about people from different languages, different countries, different cultures, different ages, men, women, all kinds of people. Some of them were dead more than six minutes, some of them less, but when they return back to life they're all discovering more or less the same movie. And let's see exactly what they have to say. First thing, which is a very common thing, they all reported that from the moment of their accident or the heart attack or whatever the case was from that moment they felt that they came out of their body the body fell on the ground and from that moment on they were flying above the body just like a leaf that flies in the air from the wind and slowly slowly they were rising higher and higher and higher towards the ceiling some of them already went above the ceiling above the, 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 the roof of the hospital and some of them didn't reach that point. They all reported that once they were out of their body, they were able to function to hear everything that is happening all over the hospital. They were able to describe every room in a hospital, even though their body was in the first floor in the emergency room. There was no way physically they went to the seventh floor or to the tenth floor in a hospital. They were able to describe in details with names and colors what's happening in almost every room of the hospital. Even giving descriptions of what happened on the roof of the hospital. And later they went and checked and they saw that everything they reported is 100% precise. And it's very interesting. Then they report that even though they, they travel in the entire hospital, at the same time they can describe simultaneously what is taking place in some, somewhere in a highway where the accident took place. So they can be physically in two different places at the same time. They are right here in a hospital in one city and at the same time they're describing what happened exactly where the accident took place which can be sometimes five or ten miles away. And this is something that a person cannot do, be in two places at the same time, we all understand that. And then they begin to report that they enter a very dark tunnel. In the beginning it's very dark. And then a few moments later it begins, they begin to see light and the lights becoming more and more bright. Brighter and brighter until it's so bright that all of them say that they never saw in their entire life any light in this physical world that comes anywhere near this amazing light inside that tunnel. And then, of course, they begin to describe a spiritual connection, a wonderful feeling that they had communicating with this light. The way of communication was a little bit different than the way we communicate with each other. 
There was no voice coming from their mouth. It was all telepathy. Once a person thinks before he talks, over there you don't need to talk. As soon as you think, the other entity already got your message and transfer you information through telepathy. Then they describe that there was like a valley, that in the beginning, as I say, it was dark, but later they started to see the light. They saw mutual circles that they flying inside the circles in a very fast speed, and there is a ring, a voice that they hear become louder and louder by the minute. And later they begin to see some of their relatives and friends who passed away before them. There are people, deceased people, grandmothers, grandfathers, uncles, good friends who passed away and they see them flying around them. This is a very interesting image that a person feels that all of them came to welcome him to the next world. And as I said before, remember, this is people from different cultures, different religions, different ages, completely different. Obviously, there's no conspiracy that millions of people throughout the world all decided to describe the same lie. It's impossible to even imagine such a thing. So it's all authentic. Then, then after they see the relatives, they begin to review their entire life in very fast pictures. Snaps, one picture after the other, millions of pictures describing 30, 40, 50 years of life in the right chronological order, which is very interesting. It's not a regular video, just like a movie that we see today. It was very, very fast pictures. The ability of the brain is a million times greater or even better because here in this physical world the brain is limited it's just as much as a person can receive but over there there was no limitations you can see millions of pictures from the time you were crawling on the rug as a baby until you became 50 years old and then something happened and you died and later a few minutes later you return back to conscious to life and you describe all your entire life in fast pictures from a to z and in different parts of the world, different kinds of people, different languages, etc. And let's read some of the things that they had to say. The, I was up. I saw my body laying on the surgery uh, bed. I saw how the doctor is working and operating on my body. I saw they connected the electrical shock and I saw my body is jumping every time the doctor connected the electric to my chest. Few seconds after, I felt that I'm falling heavily back into my body and I open up my eyes and I return back to conscious. Another person, I knew I'm dying, but there's nothing I could do about it. Nobody heard me. I was trying to scream to get attention, to try to save my body. I was out of my body. There's no doubt about it. I saw my body in a surgery room. I heard the doctors is giving up on my life. I felt horrible because I wasn't ready to die. Another person, I was out of my body, there's no doubt about it. But I knew clearly there's two possibilities. One that I will return back to the life and another one that I will remain over there and will not return. And they reported that in the beginning as a great feeling of peaceful feeling, spiritual pleasure. It's hard to describe in words. In the beginning, they feel that they are with such a beautiful spiritual connection to this light, the spiritual light. And uh, they, they report that they never felt such happiness in their entire life. I was out of my body. In the beginning, I felt horrible, but then I started to see this huge light and it, it was covering me from all over. I felt warm, but I wasn't blinded. At the same time, when this light was very close to me, I felt that I still able to see the operation room, the hospital, the doctors, the nurses, and everything else. It was an amazing light, wonderful, beautiful, shining, covering from all over, very highly spiritual. Love that I never felt in my entire life. I felt a great connection. It was very powerful, full of mercy. When I was there in front of this light, I felt so great. I thought to myself, it's better I will not return. 
Some reported, not all, but some reported that there's a point that they reach a line and everybody understand in their mind that once you cross this line, there's no return. But as long as you did not cross that line, it's possible for you to return back into this existing life. And we continuing, they reported that they saw the relatives, the friends, they come to welcome them and they feel that, you know, it's a very special, special meeting. They didn't expect to see these relatives over there. This is people I knew from school, friends that passed away from my school, from my elementary school, from my high school. I saw them very close to me. I felt their presence. I saw my relatives. They all passed away, but they all came to welcome me into the next world. I saw them clearly in my brain. I saw them with their image, with their fingers, with everything, with their legs, image, and etc. And this is an example uh, of a Gentile that describe uh, how he conclude this experience that he had. Uh, as I said before, they all reported that they reviewed their entire life. From the minute they remember they started their life to the minute of the death, they basically saw every image of their life in a very, very fast order, the right order. And this is a Gentile, that this is, a, this is what he had to say when he came back to life. He said, I was very embarrassed for many things that I saw. They showed me what I've done wrong. I felt to myself, I wish I would have not done those things. I wish I can return back to that moment of time and correct them and redo it in a proper way. Major disappointment that I did not do anything substantial in my life. I did not achieve anything. I do not know anything. I did not complete one thing in a perfect way. And this is a Gentile that according to the Torah, the Gentiles, in order for them to be righteous, all they have to do is to keep the seven laws of Noah. After the flood, 4,200 years ago, the world restarted. God wiped out all the wicked people from the world and started a new world from eight people who remain in the ark. Noah and his wife, his three sons, and their wives, the world restarted 4,200 years ago. From then until now, we have 7 billion people. In a period of 4,200 years, many generations develops from these eight people. And the Gentiles, which did not receive the Torah in Mount Sinai, so 900 years from the flood of Noah until the Jews received the Torah in Mount Sinai after the exodus of Egypt, 900 years, every person in the world was subject to keep the seven law that God told Noah after he came out from the ark. Then the Jews were collected and gathered around Mount Sinai and heard Moses speaking to God. He started to tell them the Ten Commandments as the Torah described. Once he concluded the, the Second Commandment, the Jews could not take uh, the event. It was too hard for them. It was too scary. They started to beg Moses, please, you go and speak to God. Whatever he say, we promise to do. And God, Moses had to relax them and say, no, God is not doing any harm to you. It's only a test. He loves you. He promised to your father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that he, you know, he will uh, continue the covenant with their children. Uh, so there's nothing for you to be afraid. All the nice words of Moses did not help. The Jews just was afraid to hear. God continuing with his, with his voice. And Moses went up for 40 days and brought out the written, the oral Torah and the Ten Commandments. This is how it is described in a chapter of Jethro in the written Torah. How exactly it was, a voice of a shofar, a horn, uh, a very, very uh, loud siren who becomes stronger by the hour, uh, a huge amount of fire on a mountain, uh, fog, the, the floor was shaking and then the voice of God started and millions of witnesses saw for the first and last time in history a religion started in front of millions of witnesses. There are more than 80,000 religions and cults today in the world. All of them claim they got some, something from God, most of them at least. The only difference is, the only problem is that it all started with the story of one individual. One day Muhammad came from the desert and claimed Angel Gabriel gave him the Quran. Nobody ever witnessed that event, according to the Quran itself. 
One day Mary said that she had a dream and God came to her in a dream and made her pregnant. Nobody can witness a dream. Nobody ever saw that God really spoke to her. She had all the reason to say story to save her life after becoming pregnant without uh, her fiance, without her husband. Joseph the carpenter went away, comes back, he finds she's pregnant. She told him something uh, obviously to protect her dignity and now the world has to to choose if they want to believe that story or not. So a, a main religion, Christianity, is based on the story of a woman that claims she had a dream. There are a few problems with this dream because in the book of, of God, the Torah, what the Christian called the Old Testament, it says clearly that God warned people, Jews and non-Jews, that one of the most horrible sins is to touch a married woman. If she belongs to one man, no other man is allowed to touch her, not, not to talk about having full relation with her. So obviously if someone does such a thing, both of them are subject to a horrible punishment. It's not realistic that God himself, after warning so many times not to do such a horrible, ugly thing, went and did something like this himself, went to a married woman and made her pregnant. Uh, that's something that it's hard to, to believe, but believe it or not, we find today more than a billion people who follow that story, dedicate parts of their life to a story of one individual. Same thing Buddha. One day Buddha came, he claimed that uh, he saw the light. How many people witness it? None. But Judaism, which is the first religion, it's 1300 years before Christianity, 1800 years before Islam. Uh, Buddhism is only 2400 years, so it's 900 years before Buddhism. Judaism started with millions of witnesses. No one would accept this difficult religion that has 613 commandments, more than any other religion to keep, unless if they saw a, a something solid. No one would just believe a story of one person who would change their life drastically just because he claimed God spoke to him. And obviously there are many, many proofs which I spoke about it in my film Torah and Science. Everyone who is interested will watch that film. There's hundreds of proofs over there that leaves no doubt that the Torah is 100% divine and only the Torah. What Christians call the Old Testament is the only valid book that was given by God to people on this earth. No other book or no other cult or religion was given by the real God. Only individuals like me and you invented that book. It's full of errors, full of contradictions, many mistakes, many human errors that leaves no doubt that God was not able to write a book with so many human errors because God is divine, is perfect, and etc. So here, since the Gentiles has to keep only seven laws, we have a, a testimony of a Gentile who came back to life and claimed that he felt horrible and he realized that he did not complete one major thing in his life. Obviously, we're talking spiritually here. Uh, it's needless to say that by the Jews, the responsibility is much higher. The reward and the punishments of a Jew is much greater than a Gentile. Once he does good, his reward is in a higher level. Once he does bad, his punishment is in a higher level. It's all measure for measure. And as we see, to follow 613 laws as opposed to seven is a big difference. But also the reward and the punishments are completely from a different league, as we review in the Torah. But a Gentile that keeps the seven law is considered a righteous Gentile and goes to heaven. Now remember, being a righteous Gentile has nothing to do with Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, and uh, Islam. Nothing whatsoever. This is a man-man religion that people that decided to make a book, as I said before, full of errors, and they made all kinds of laws. This is all man-made laws, all kinds of fasts, all kinds of customs that was made by people. If you want to follow it, it's your choice. If you want to follow really the request of your Creator, you have to go into the Torah as a Gentile and of course as a Jew. And over there you have all the instructions, what's recommended to do and what is not. So we move on. We're back to our uh, subject here. Uh, we are uh, reading some of the testimonies of people who died and came back to life. How they describe what happened to them when they were out of their body even for more than six minutes. Uh, Dr. Elizabeth Kovler-Ross, the world-known uh, psychiatrist that she's uh, been investigating this subject for more than 20 years, 
and wrote books and articles about it. This is what she writes. People who parts of their body were chopped off. They were reported that once they left their body and they felt that the soul is flying in space, they were complete again. There's no parts missing. More than that, people who are blind reported in colors. When they are alive, they cannot see any colors. But at the time that they came out of their body, they were able to describe everything in colors. Once the soul returned back into the body and they came back to conscious, again they see everything black. But the five or ten minutes they were out of the body, they were able to describe everything in colors. More than that, people who were born blind, up to now I was speaking about blind people at one point of their life became blind, so they recognized color from the days they used to see. Now we are talking people who were born blind. They never saw colors one second in their life. People like that that died and came back to life, the few minutes that their soul were out of the body, they were able to describe everything in color. How such a thing is possible. If a person, if you take a blind person and try to explain to him the color blue, no matter what you're going to say, he cannot imagine the color blue. He never saw it. You tell him it looks like green. He will ask you, what's green? You tell him it looks like the sky. He say, what's the sky? It's relaxing. It's like the ocean. No matter what you say, he doesn't have any idea what you're talking about. You show him one second blue and you return them back to be blind. That's enough. Now he knows what blue is. It's already recorded in his memory. But people who were born blind reported in colors. What does it mean? It means that in previous life, they did see colors. They recognize color from somewhere, not from this physical life. This physical life that they live right now, currently, they never saw colors. When the soul came out of the body, as the Torah said, there's no limitation, no limitation of distance, of memory, of visions, of hearing, no limitations whatsoever because the soul is a spark of God, is a spiritual, complete, perfect, spark of God himself, no limitation whatsoever. Same thing, God is not limited. The divine soul that was pushed into Adam Nastros, into every human being, is 100% spiritual with no limitation. The limitation exists only when the soul enters the body. Once the soul is in the body, the body overcoming the ability of the soul and limits the soul. Once the soul exits the body, it can see to four directions simultaneously can hear everything that happens around. No limitation whatsoever. So people who came out of their body, blind people were born blind. When they came back to life, they were able to report everything that happens in a hospital in colors. What jacket the doctor is wearing, what color his glasses, the watch, the equipment in the room, everything. Which leaves no doubt that they receive this ability in previous life, otherwise where else they bringing this knowledge from. So the conclusion of Dr. Elizabeth Kobler-Ross, she says like this, I know beyond any doubt that once we will die, life will continue. Those who want to hear will hear, and the ones who want to ignore will ignore. But there's no doubt whatsoever for me that life really begins in a time of death. Dr. Kenneth Ring, I believe that we will re remain in our conscious, in our spiritual way, once our physical body will die, but the soul will remain. The conclusion, a person is a combination of body and soul. The soul will separate from the body, the body will return to the sand, will evaporate eventually, but the soul will remain forever. There are few possibilities according to the Torah and Kabbalah what can happen to that soul. One option is that the soul will, gi will be given another chance, and that's what we call reincarnation, which we're going to speak about shortly. The soul will enter again a baby that is about to be born, and start a new life, 60, 70, 80 years somewhere, with new tests, 
as God is watching every step that person will do and eventually will decide what to do with him in the next time of death. That's one option. Sometimes the people can be reincarnated in bodies of Down syndrome and autistic kids, which means they are not here for a test. It's strictly a punishment for certain sins they used to do in their previous lives. Usually these kind of people are mute and dead. It's all measure for measure for sins that they did in previous life with their mouth and their ears. And that's usually righteous people who did everything right except one problem. Speaking bad about others and listening to bad about others, enjoying uh, other people's problems. They are usually the ones who come in this kind of reincarnation. There's another option. There are different kinds of reincarnations in raw material, such as rocks, sand in plants and in fruits and vegetables that's another uh, part another uh, options of reincarnation there's reincarnations in animals such as dogs birds snakes etc and there is one more option so that a person's soul goes to a place what we call Gehenom in Hebrew which is hell in English or heaven that means the soul is finished his correction goes to heaven and doesn't have to come back to any test. He passed his test and he's done with this physical world. However, the ones who go to hell, there are seven different parts over there. This is what we call a dry clean for the soul. Believe it or not, that's already a positive place, even though the suffering is tremendous over there. But the soul get cleansed from all the spiritual stains that a person accumulate with all the sins that he did in his, pre in his previous life. Once the soul get clean completely, the soul will enter heaven and remain there until the, we go into different parts of the world, which will be the days of Messiah, the resurrection of the dead, the 7,000 of the creation, and then later the life of eternity, which is a whole different subject, a whole different lecture. Then. So we understand that there are seven different parts, one below the other. That's what we call Gehenom, hell. And there's one more option, it's called Kafa Kela, that the soul is in space. And this is a very horrible situation. Hope none of us will ever get to that situation. But the, the Torah said that the wicked people are being put in space just like a slingshot and fly from one place to the other with no rest whatsoever until eventually this kind of punishment finish. We are talking really, really wicked and evil people that did very bad against God and against humanity. Those are the ones who usually get this kind of punishment. But there are many people, you know, that were righteous and listened to all the instructions of God and when they died, in their previous life they made repentance for the sins and they came pretty clean and they go to heaven and in that case they don't have to go through this procedure of cleansing their soul because they did it with their free choice while they were living here in this physical world. what the Torah had to teach us 3,300 years and it was given to Moses in Mount Sinai about the afterlife, about life after death, about reincarnations, etc. In the Gemara, in the Talmud, in the chapter of Passover, this is what it says. Rabbi Yosef, the son of Rabbi Yoshua, became very sick and then he died. Then later when he came back to life, his father asked him, what did you see in the upper world? He told him, I saw everything is the opposite of what we think here. Those who are very important in this world are nothing over there. 
And the ones who are not important over there are very important in the upper world. And his father told him, son, this is really the way the Torah told us that that's how it's going to be. The ones who learn a lot of Torah here, they don't, they don't deserve the respect and the honor. They don't get the, the respect and the honor that they deserve. Why? Because over here, people like to respect all kinds of financially successful people, famous people, movie stars, athletes, etc. But over there in the world of the truth, they appreciate someone who learned the book of God all his life and reached a very high level of righteousness. That's why those who are not so important here, they're not famous, they are very important over there. But the ones who are very rich and famous and important over here, and make many sins and crimes against God, over here they receive a lot of attention and respect, but over there they're going to have a very serious problem. So this is the conclusion of this page in the Talmud. Then the son says one more thing. He says, I heard an announcement where I was dead and my soul was there in a court of heaven. I heard an announcement. How lucky is someone who came here with Torah knowledge in his hand? which means he gained lots of knowledge of the Book of God, and now he, this knowledge is going to serve him and reward him, etc. Then in another place, this is in the Zohar, the sages, our rabbis from more than 2,000 years ago, this is what they write. Rabbi Kospadai, one of the rabbis who lived at that time, everyone was sure he died. They checked his pulse, whatever, his breath, and he was dead. Later, he came back to life and describe the elevation of his soul to the upper world and started to describe his trial. According to Judaism, when a person passed away, once the soul exits the body, there is a period of seven days that the soul goes back and forth from the grave in a cemetery to the house where the relative sits on the floor. It's called sitting Shiva. Sitting Shiva at seven days of mornings you know, that the relative, the sons, the daughters, the brothers, the sisters, they sit on the floor on a mattress or something and they mourn from the, for the death of their dear. That period of seven days, the soul still travel back and forth from the grave into the place. After that, the trial begins. What does it mean, the trial? Every person who finishes life term has a one-year trial in the court of heaven in front of God and the court of heaven. The difference between the court over here and this physical world to that court that over here people lie and deceive and bring false testimonies and false documents and do everything they can to fool the judge and the jury and, and go out of any guilt. But over there, there's no lies because everything is recorded. As the Torah said, there's an eye who watch over you, there's an ear who listens to you, and everything you do is registered in the book of God. There's not one beep that came out of a person now that you will be able to hide. There's nobody to bribe. There's no possibility to change details like people do here. So over there it's a serious trial. And once a person go there, it's a period of one year trial. That's why the Jewish custom is a very old custom of saying a special prayer for the deceased people, what we call Kaddish special prayer that we say for a period of one year. There's no coincidence why it's one year. It's one year because our dear is standing in his trial in front of God in the court of heaven and he needs every mercy that we can supply him. And that's the custom of saying Kaddish. It's the reason that people sit seven days on the floor and they mourn, that's because the Torah taught us that the soul still travel back and forth to the house, from the house into the grave. So the deceased person is still able to see who really cared that he died and who doesn't care. And many other things that, you know, applies to the death of a person. Then the Zohar, the Kabbalah, three days after the death, the soul is still not sure if he's going to die permanently or return back to life. Seven days it travels back and forth from the grave, and after seven days it's clear 100% that life here really ended. When the soul comes out of this world, it enters a cave, the cave of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, spiritually, fly through that cave into, the, into heaven, into the upper world. 
Then Rabbi Dosa said in Exodus 33, the Torah say, God speaks and say in the Torah, a person cannot see me and remain alive. No person can see my holiness and stay here to testify about it. But once he died, everyone will see me. Why? The Torah say, everyone who goes down to the grave will bow down in front of God. Every person, the Kabbalah say, that goes to the next world will see the light of God. And uh, the Zohar in a chapter of Kedoshim, of Holy, this is a chapter in the Torah, so the Kabbalah is speaking about it. There's nothing harder to the soul from the separation from the body. And a person does not die until he sees the light of God. Out of strong desire to this light, he comes out of the physical body towards that special light. Remember what all the deceased people who died and came back to life describe? All over the world, from different cultures, different religions, all of them describe they saw this great, huge spiritual light. Everything being black at first and everything lightened to gray essences. Tim Spinnard was 14 years old when a school gym accident sent him tumbling headfirst into the hardwood. Spinnard says he left his body and started down a tunnel with other human forms. This was written more than 2,000 years ago and was given to the Jews 3,300 years ago in Mount Sinai. When the time comes for a person to pass away from this world, the soul comes out of the body and see the Spirit of God right away. Out of happiness to this image, he comes out of the body. If he's righteous, he stick to that light. And if not, eventually the light will disappear and he will stay to mourn from the separation from his body. This is in a book of Zohar, Kabbalah, in a chapter of leprosy, Parashat Metzorah, page 53. In the time of death, a person gets permission to see and understand all the mysteries of his life. Everything that happens to us here, we have no idea what's going on. You miss the flight, you were supposed to get married, in the last minute you got cancelled, some people have kids, some people don't have kids, some people lose a lot of money, some people make a lot of money, all kinds of sicknesses, all kinds of habits. There's things that is beyond any, any possibility of understanding what's happening to us. Almost everything in our life, it's not in our hand, except one thing, which is the free choice to be righteous or wicked. Nobody asks you if you be a male or female. Nobody asks you if you be a wealthy person or not. It's not in our hand. Whatever God's want, that's what's going to be. If we're going to have healthy life overall, or life full of sicknesses, it's not always in our hand. Yeah, we can keep ourselves a healthy lifestyle, but there's some kind of sicknesses that it's not in our hand. We cannot control it. And many things, if you get married or not, many people do everything they can to get married and they just couldn't. And some people right away, easily, they got married. Some people do everything they can to have children and they can't. Some people, right, one after the other, with no problems. And there are many, many other examples. The Torah says that when a husband and wife connects together, they have relation, and the woman conceived that night, it would take 40 days for the baby to be formed into a human being. First 40 days, not a complete human being yet. In the 40th day, he begins to have pulse, brain waves, nerve system, everything. And that's very interesting, because the Gemara said, the Talmud, the Oral Torah, teaching us that the angel come and take a drop of seed to the court of heaven, and they have to decide now which soul from all the deceased people who are waiting for another reincarnation to come back to this life for another opportunity, for another test. So which soul will be given to this husband and wife, this specific husband and wife, it's no coincidence. For millions of people who are waiting for another chance, God has to choose the one who match this couple, this environment, this city, this place, there are many, many factors here. And once you decide which person comes back, this person will come back with the weaknesses that he still did not correct in his previous life. Which means, if in his previous life he started very stingy, 
but throughout his lifetime, eventually he worked on his problem and became a generous person. But he has to correct other things, such as laziness, such as anger, and other problems that he has. When he will be reborn into a new life, he doesn't bring the ex, the previous weakness that he had, which was being stingy because he already corrected it. However, since he did not correct his anger problem, he's born with anger problem. That's the reason sometimes you see little kids, one is two years old and the other one is two years old. One is very angry, every little thing is scream and throw things and it's very violent. And the other one is very calm and relaxed and is not violent, is not screaming, is not getting angry. Sometimes you look at the baby, you give them a bag of pretzel, and then you ask them to give you one. First one will give you the entire bag without crying. Second one will give you two, three. Once you ask for too much, you begin to cry. And the third one, even one will not give you. Who told him to be stingy? He's only two years old. Nobody told him how many bags of pretzels we have. Maybe I can give him thousands of bags. There's no limitation. How does he know to be able to scream and cry when I took too much from him? You know, it's very interesting. The, the answer is, he died stingy and he came back to the world with the same weakness. Same thing women. Women that had modesty problems, they are born with modesty problems since they never corrected it. But women who already corrected the modesty issues, when they're born into this new world, they don't have this test. They passed that test in their previous life. That's why when they come back to life again, they don't have a strong desire to be not modest and to live a non-modest life. So everything that we have here, all the desires that we have, and, and all of us have different desires. Some have more in here and have less in there. This is not coincidence. It's not the nature of a person. This is how he died in his previous life. And he still gave, was given another chance by God to correct. But eventually the chances will be over and the person will have to be judged permanently for his status for eternity. No more tests, no more correction. As long as we are alive, we can correct. Once we passed away, there is no guarantee that we'll be given another chance. Some of the wicked people were not returned here. There's no guarantee that a person will come back again in reincarnation. The Torah says, when the time when a person passed away, he began to understand all the mysteries, many things that happened in his life, how many things God saved him from, how many favors he did to him, why did he miss certain flights, why did he miss the bus, why this is what happened to him, why he never had kids, why he never got married, why he got married three times, all the things that we don't understand why and why and why, all the answer will be given in the time of the death. And one more thing, the next world, the Torah say, is wide, no borders, no walls, no ceilings, no limitations, huge light, spiritual light that is different than the light that we have in this world. When the time comes for a righteous person to pass to the next world, God is commanding all the righteous people who already passed away, go and welcome him. And they all come and say, come in peace. This is in a Talmud, in the chapter of Ketubot, page 104. And a time of a person, time for a person came to die, he gets permission to see his relatives and friends from this physical world and he's able to recognize them. If you remember, the people who died, they all reported that they saw their relatives and friends. This is in the Torah that was given to us 3,300 years in Mount Sinai. How the Torah was able to know? The answer is, of course, God gave us the book and he told us all the secrets. No human being was able to predict such thing and to know such things. Everything I saw in the name of science and parapsychology is discoveries that almost all of them are only 30 years old and less. Most of them nobody knew 100 years ago. This is information who came from 3,300 years ago, from very primitive generations. We didn't have the equipment that we have today. There was no ability to revive people in a surgery room. You're either alive or you're dead. Once you stop breathing, you're dead. There's no other way. And those people who reported what happened to them when they died, as you can see, the Torah already told us all this information from A to Z, but there's much more to come. 
when a person, when a righteous person is passing away from the world, God sends all the righteous people to welcome him and they say to him, come in peace. And then he gets permission to see all his friends and relatives and recognize them in their image. And they're happy towards him and they welcome him, him and they're walking him through. This is in the book of Zohar, the Kabbalah, in the chapter Vayechi, page 218. In the Gemara, in the Talmud, in the chapter of Brachot, page 28, it says that the president of Israel in the time of the destruction of the second temples, when the Romans destroyed the second temple, the president of Israel, his name was, was Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. And in the time of his death, he said to his students around his bed, prepare a chair for Hizkiyahu, the king of Judah. He came to welcome me into the next world. He was able to see already some images around him and recognize the president of Judah, one of the most righteous kings that the Jewish nation had, lived approximately 2,600 years ago, King Hizkiyahu. It's very interesting because I know of a person that when his father passed away was standing next to his bed and they live in the second floor in a building in Israel. And uh, about an hour before his father passed away, his father was constantly saying, why the neighbor from the first floor is here? Why the neighbor from the first floor is here? Remember, they live in the second floor and he complained that he see the neighbor from the apartment downstairs. And his son thought that his father hallucinating, so he told him, Dad, forget about it. What do you care about the neighbor right now? You don't feel so good. Don't talk too much. You're dreaming. You're hallucinating. And the father constantly looking up and say, I see the neighbor. Later, when the father passed away, they found out that they came to collect two bodies from the same building at the same time. And they just found out that an hour before the father passed away, the neighbor from downstairs actually passed away before him. And he already was able to see her spirit around him in a room when she was already dead. Nobody else knew that, he's, that she's dead, but he already saw it, which means that his soul started already to leave the body. The soul doesn't leave in a second. It's like dripping slowly, slowly. It's an, a divine energy. It's dripping out of the body slowly, slowly until it comes out completely and no life remains in the physical body. When a person passed away from this world, he sees his entire life and all his actions. And they ask him in the court of heaven, do you see what you did in that particular day, in that particular moment? Do you confirm it? And obviously everyone has no choice but to confirm. And they say yes and yes. And God say, you have to sign because you are going to be judged for everything you did and nobody can run away from his judgment over there. When a time comes for a person to die, God comes to him and says, sign here, because you're going to be judged for what you did, and he writes, and he signs, and there's no argument. You should always remember what's above you, there's an eye who watch over you, there's a he who listens to you, and everything you do is registered in the book of God. This is what the Talmud say in a chapter of Masechet Avot, you know, and this is uh, very interesting. It's, uh, it's a, a recommendation for every human being never to forget that just when we think we're alone and we're making some scenes in some hidden rooms, please don't ever, for, don't ever forget that God is watching and everything is being written in his book. Many people ask if that's the case, I've been making many sins for many, many years. I don't see that God ever punished me for what I do. And I've seen people who does a lot of good things according to the Torah, and they're not getting any reward. So me, that making many sins, I'm not getting punishment. And my friend who makes a lot of good de deeds is not getting any reward. So where is the justice, and where is that I and ears who listens and watch you as the Torah say? The answer is very simple. This, answer was ans this question was already answered by the Torah. God says that his response is not instant. If he will respond right away, which means every person who makes a sin will get punished within seconds. And every person who does something good will get rewarded right away. In that case, the free choice will be completely cancelled. No free choice. If a person makes a sin and gets punished right away, 
after the second scene, everyone gets the point. After the second scene, everyone knows, if I'll make another scene, I get another punch. So what's the point? Nobody would move. Nobody would make a scene. No one has a test. The test is that you can do whatever you want and it seems that nothing is happening. No good, no bad. Coincidence. No supervision. That's what it looks like. But the answer is, there is a divine book which takes minutes to prove that a person was unable to write such a book. No person as brilliant as it may be. Take thousands of brilliant people who ever lived here, combine all of them together, give them all the equipment you can think of, give them a thousand years. They cannot write one chapter of the Torah. It's full of prophecy, full of divine knowledge, full of physical knowledge about nature, about animals, millions of animals, species, predicting the future, controlling nature, making promises what will happen and what will never happen in nature that a person will never be able to control such things. Giving us information about the number of the stars in the universe, giving us information about the renewal of the moon to six digits after the decimal point in a generation that we didn't even have a calculator and many many other examples if you are interested in some of these uh, proofs uh, scientific proofs please refer to my film Torah and Science over there you find all the answers and many many proofs that this book can never be given by human being once we know it's a divine book all we have to do is follow the instruction of the book we are not more clever than our Creator. If He told us something, that means that's the positive thing to do. That's the great recommendation. Even if our understanding showing us the opposite, we have to recognize that we are limited. We don't have His abilities. We don't have His thoughts. We don't have His intelligence. What we will do in a billion years, He can do a trillion times more than that every second. It's nothing to compare. As a matter of fact, God said to us in the Torah, don't try to compare yourself to me. My thoughts and your thoughts are not in the same level. Comparing you to me is like comparing a worm to an eagle. Comparing a deep valley into a huge mountain. There's nothing to compare. And there's other analogies in the Tanakh, in the, in the 24 box of Judaism, which leaves no doubt. And every human being who tries to put himself in the same level of his Creator and think he knows better or just as much, it's very, very foolish. So the recommendation of the Torah and God say to us, you should do what's good and decent in the eyes of your God, not what's in your eyes or the society or your teacher in high school. You have to do what I told you to do for your own benefit, that I should reward you and your children for eternity. There's a verse in the Torah for those who ask, how do we know there's life after death? The answer is, in the Torah it says, the righteous people would live forever. They and their children will be rewarded for eternity. Eternity means endless. Billions of years is not even the beginning. So let's move on. Everything you say in front of the dead people, he knows until you cover the body. This is in the Talmud, in the chapter of Shabbat, Sabbath, page 152. And he's still connected to this physical world a little bit until the worms finish to eat the entire body, which takes up to 11 months. So it's very interesting. As long as the grave is open and the body is not covered with sand, the person with his soul that is flying above the body sees the entire funeral. See what, who cries, who screams, all the prayers, whatever the people say, the, the eulogy, he sees everything. Once the body is covered, he loses most of his abilities to be connected to this world. No more communication. But there is some limited communication. We don't know exactly up to what level, but there is some, of commun some communication until the worms will finish to eat the entire flesh and the skins and everything else. The Gemara says in a chapter of Sabbath, page 153, Rav said to Rav Shmuel Bar Shilat, in the time of my death, please make me a respectable eulogy, because I will be above you and would hear everything you say. How did he know? This is more than 2,000 years ago in Babylon, where we, what we call Iraq today. How did he know that once he would say eulogy for his, for his, for his uh, death, he would be above him and listen to everything? Why? Because God told us in the Torah 
that life is a body and soul, and the soul comes out of the body, it will be above the body, the body will go to the grave, but the soul will still be around and still hear and listen and everything else. So uh, we so far finished this part of showing what the Torah has to say about uh, life after life, reincarnation. There's more information who comes right now. Remember the Torah say there are three different ways to communicate with the deceased people. Now we're going now to explain how it's possible. Uh, the Torah says the, the Rambam, Maimonides, who lived almost 900 years ago, he explained now what was the ways that people use to communicate with the deceased people. One way is by starving himself, fasting for a few days, and going to the, to the cemetery, sleeps on the graves until the impurity falls and connects to his body and then he's able to communicate with dead people. Then there's another way that we can communicate through a middleman. The middleman is able to communicate with the dead people and pass information to us and obviously the information is very authentic. It's secret information that only you and your dear who passed away knows. It could be husband and wife. They have some mutual secrets. This middleman doesn't know it, neither one of them, but he passed the information from the deceased person into the wife, and she obviously understands that her husband is present here, because otherwise how this medium knows all their secrets? He received it from her husband who passed away. There are seance, what we call Ouija board, by taking a glass, taking a piece of carbon paper, writing the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, and uh, we write numbers from zero to nine and we ask for a soul of a person we light candles we make a dark room and this, the glass begins to move and then we get answers by connecting the letters the glass roof from one letter to another uh, looks like a magic show but obviously many millions of people did it and report results and uh, we get answers from people who died through the glass so this is another way to communicate this. In the Tanakh, in the Bible, in the book of Samuel, it described that King Saul was very worried because tomorrow there's going to be a big war with Amalek, and he didn't know what's going to be. He was very worried, and he went to a woman, a medium, and asked her to communicate with the spirit of Prophet Samuel. She didn't know she's speaking to the King Saul because he came with a custom. And then Prophet Samuel came, the first thing he said to him, why did you disturb me to bring me back to this physical world? And King Saul apologized and said, please forgive me, I'm so worried about what's going to happen tomorrow. That's why I wanted you to help me to tell me what's going to happen and what to do. So the prophet told him, tomorrow you and your children are here with me. And that's what happened. The next day King Saul and all his sons died in a war. And that's what happened. The bad news that he told him tomorrow all of you will die and that's what happened. The good news is that all of us wish to be in heaven in the same level like Prophet Samuel, which was as the, one of the most legendary righteous people ever lived. In the, in the league of Moses and Aaron and the top people who ever lived in history. So he came to a very, very high level in heaven because there's unlimited different levels according to how righteous the person is. And he, came, he made it to a very high level, but the interesting thing that it's in the Tanakh, it's in the Holy uh, Scripture, that it says that uh, King Prophet Samuel is somewhere in heaven, and he told the, the king, you and your children will join me here, which means they are somewhere, they never die permanently, and this is it. Let's explain what medium is. As I said, a medium is a third party, is a middleman who can sit between you and the deceased person. You want to get information from someone who passed away. And you cannot communicate directly, so you need an assistant, someone that is able to do it. I give an example from two very famous mediums in the past uh, that were able to communicate with many deceased people and transfer information from them into their relatives. Uh, one of them, uh, her name is Lineora Pfeiffer, and the other one is Eileen Gartz. And they were obviously uh, unique people who have uh, spiritual abilities. They go into trance and they loose, loosen up, 
and they're able to communicate directly with people who passed away and transfer information, personal information, secrets that nobody else was able to know. Of course, they investigated them, they checked all around uh, if they have any kind of trick, and it came 100% legit. Uh, Leonora Pfeiffer from Boston, she was able in a, in a seance that she participated in to communicate between her customers to their uh, relatives for a period of 40 years. She was checked by seven different teams of investigators. Uh, in a period of one and a half years, between 1885 to 1886, uh, uh, William James, which is a very famous psychologist and philosopher from Harvard University, was following her, investigating her for a year and a half, every day, every hour. And then he published a conclusion that she's 100% legit. The information that she supply, no other person is able to know these things. She's obviously communicate with the deceased people and transfer the information. Uh, another example, uh, when, uh, da when William uh, James uh, filed his report in 1887, you know, uh, he was sent uh, in Dr. Richard Hodgson, which was a very famous investigator to catch scams and, uh, and fakers. He was sent to the United States to open an investigation and spent 18 years, believe it or not, 18 years of following Mrs. Pfeiffer investigate her background, her history, hire detectives to follow her, uh, confuse her with different customers, switching customers, doing all kinds of tricks. And yet he was never able to catch anything that was not legit. She was 100% legit. She's able to communicate with dead people and transfer information from them. Let's see some of the things that she said. Uh, one person is speaking to his friend they is reminding him how they used to jump like frogs when they used to be kids. They're going to school, they're laughing. And uh, he described his death, how, how symptoms that he had before he passed away. And he say, you were not there. I was expecting you to be there. You're not there. And, uh, you know, things like that. In one of the seans, one of the people uh, referred to one of the people in the audience and started to talk to him was his, his relative and speaking about a gold watch that he left and where is the watch right now so information that obviously nobody can fake here uh, Pfeiffer was invited in 1889 to England and she was uh, examined by the spiritual union uh, they put her in uh, isolation they checked she wasn't allowed any letters or any communication with people from out of the room and uh, after all the special supervision that she received, she was able to give 100% authentic information, which is in incredible, but 100% legit. There are mediums that are uh, transferring information in a unique way, such as automatic writing. They're taking a pen and they're holding a pen in such a way that not, usually a person holds the pen just like that to write but they're holding the pen from the uh, from the top and uh, after a few minutes the pen begins to move by itself and write uh, information on a piece of paper so obviously uh, you know uh, when a person is half fainted and is not in full conscious and the pen begins to move by itself and write things on a piece of paper and then later we see what the message is we find that a, a spirit of someone who we communicate with was moving the pen and giving us information. Uh, some of this information is uh, sometimes from famous people, like uh, musicians, like classical musicians, who come and write the musical notes, and then we see Mozart, Beethoven, and other famous ones who passing us information that uh, obviously this person has no knowledge in music, no formal knowledge in music, but is able to give us information about music. Uh, the American medium, Rosemary Brown, that never learned music in any school. She has no knowledge in music. She's obviously not a, mu a professional musician. She is able to write music from Chopin, Barnes, Bach, Beethoven, very famous classical musicians. How does she do it? She communicates with the spirits and they are giving her the musical notes and she writes and later they discover that this is a very famous music that they wrote. 
Another one, her name is Emma Conti. She's an Italian woman with spiritual abilities that receive music from the music, from the music writer. Her name is Emily Dinkinson. She won 46 awards for music that she wrote even though she never went even to high school. And when they ask her, how do you write such beautiful music and you win all the awards? She said, it's not even me. It's a spirit of this uh, musician, uh, you know, that I'm receiving. Her name is Emily Dinkinson, who was a famous musician. And she gives me the music and I'm Emma Conti and I write whatever she gives me and that's it. It's nothing to do with my knowledge or uh, something that I learned or it's not my personal talent. So here is an example of communicating with someone who died and receiving information from him, which means he's somewhere, he's not, uh, he's not dead completely. The body is dead, but the soul is somewhere. And according to the law, we know exactly where. So speaking about reincarnation, as I said before, the body transfer from one body to another. So the body is changing but the soul is always the same soul. So let's call the, the soul X. X was in one box and then you take it out of this box and you put the box in a different color or different size. So the bodies are changes, sometimes the color of the skin, sometimes the size of the body, sometimes male, female, doesn't matter. But the soul is the same spiritual entity that transfer from one body to another. And we have people in the world not that many, percentage-wise is way less than 1%. But still, when you collect them together, we're talking many, many thousands of people in our world that remember their previous life without being hypnotized. All of us, by hypnosis, we can find out uh, who we used to be in our previous life because doing regression is bringing us back in time and we are not in conscious. And the, 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 the psychologist, the parapsychologist who hypnotizes you right now, he chooses the times and the dates where he wants to take you back to. Sometimes he may take you back to time before you were born, and all of a sudden he may speak in a different language, which right now you are not aware of. And later when you see the video, you see that you're speaking in a language that you don't understand what you say yourself from your own mouth. And what is it? Who you used to be in your previous life. Sometimes the voice is changing. It can be a male now and all of a sudden speak in the voice of a woman or the other way around. Sometimes it's a one, now you speak in one voice and then all of a sudden you have a different voice. Male and male, but still different voice, different accent, different languages, etc. There are some people in the past, in, uh, in Jewish old documents and books, that were able to look at people and know their history and their reincarnation. One of them was the holy rabbi who lived 500 years ago, the Ariya Kadosh, Rabbi, rabbi Luria Yitzhak Ashkenazi, who lived in Tzfat 500 years ago. And he was able to see in raw material souls that are reincarnated in rocks and in certain things. And this is something very interesting from the book of his student, Rabbi Chaim Vital. And this is what he writes. There's few times I was walking with my rabbi, the Ari, in the field, and then he stopped next to a rock and he told me, you remember someone that used to be righteous and he lived and he passed away and uh, he's reincarnated in this rock for one sin that he made in his life, a very big sin, and he's in this rock or in this tree. And later we went and checked all the details about this deceased person and we found out that all the story that he told us about this anonymous person is 100% legit, even though he never met him personally. It could be somebody who passed away 20, 30 years ago, and he was able to know things with his vision, with his Holy Spirit that was on him all the time. And other people have no idea what, how to tell or even to see any of that. So this is very interesting. Uh, they went and checked the details to make sure that everything is said right here in the city of Tzfat in different parts of the world or in different parts of Israel is describing someone. Now besides, to say a story about someone who made a scene and it's not correct, that's already a scene to ruin the reputation of someone, even if he passed away from the world, ruining his name, it's something that the Torah does not permit. So a holy rabbi like this will not come and make a story about someone ruining his reputation unless if it really happens. And especially, of course, when they went and checked the details, it was always 100% precise. 
Rabbi Yuda Arye from Modena, a rabbi and a doctor in Venice, Italy, also around 500 years ago. In the beginning, did not believe in reincarnation. And something happened towards the end of his life, when he was an old man already. His neighbor gave birth to a boy, and after one month they found out that this boy is sick. And the woman, the neighbor, came to him and said, Rabbi, come, my son is six months old and he's dying. I think he's dying. Please come and say a special prayer for him. And he came and he started to pray for the boy. And just before the boy closed his eyes permanently, he opened his mouth and screamed, Shema Israel, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad is a very famous Jewish verse from the Torah. Listen, Israel, our God is one God. And he went and he died. And this is a six-month-old baby. How does he know how to talk? Cases like these are reported also in different parts of the world. In Portugal, one baby announced the name of someone which a month later became the king of Portugal. This was a Gentile. And he opened up his mouth when he was a little baby. And he announced and died right away. We don't have an explanation how a baby opened up his mouth and begin to talk. It's a message that he gives to the world. But this is obviously an indication that this is something from previous life because here is only a few months old, doesn't know how to speak it. And it's obvious. So from that moment on, he realized that, uh, the, that that's a reincarnation of someone who passed away and came back to life and died after a short period of time. In the Bible, we find cases of people who used to be somebody else. For instance, Cain, the son of Adam, murdered his brother Hebel. Later, they came back in reincarnation. Cain came back as Jethro, you know, and uh, Hebel came back as Moses. And then, since Cain murdered his brother out of jealousy, and uh, you know, and later he came to correct his sins. And it's very interesting that by now, as Jethro, he gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses to be his wife. So Cain and Abel came back in another generation, which we are talking about 2,400 years later, approximately. Two different bodies, but the same souls. Same example, uh, Aaron, the son of Aaron, and two sons, Nadav and Aviu, they passed away for servicing God in a wrong way. They passed away, and uh, they were single. They did not have wives. The sages teaching us in the Talmud that the reason they didn't have wives, they thought that no woman in a Jewish nation is worthy enough to marry them. They were very holy and high level people and they didn't find anyone to their level. Uh, so what happened? Uh, Nadav came back in a reincarnation as Samson, the prophet. And the Torah says Samson is from the, from the tribe of Dan, Badan, Bet, Daled, Nun. If we play with the order of the letter, it's the letter, it's the word Nadav. Nadav, it's Badan. The Torah is hinting to us that it's the same person. But he came in a different body. What was the end of Samson? He married a non-Jewish woman, Philistine. Her name was Delilah, and she brought his destruction to his life. He ended up killing the Philistines in the stadium, and the, all the construction side, the stadium, collapsed on his head. And he died with them before they tortured him, they blinded him, as he violated one of the rules that the Torah said that a Jewish man or a Jewish woman are not permitted to marry any other Gentile, even the most righteous Gentile in the world is against the book of God. It's not in our hand. Nobody asks you if you want or you don't want. This is a rule and that's it. And uh, he violated that rule, even though it was a very special holy man. Uh, he went after his desire and married her, and, and his end was very bitter. But why did he get such a punishment? In his previous life, he disrespected the Jewish female. In his next life, his punishment was that he married a, a Philistine, and she brought him his destruction, measure for measure. It's very interesting how these reincarnation things work. Of course, we can talk about it forever, but we have to move on. So let's talk about some proofs from our days about reincarnation. The most amount of evidence about reincarnation collected Dr. Ian Stevenson, a psychiatrist and a parapsychologist from Virginia University from the years of the 60s until our days for a period of 40 years and more. He investigated 600 cases of reincarnation throughout the world. And then he published four books, 
which he concluded his research. Usually, he investigated cases of kids two and a half years old to four years old only. Why? Because the memories from previous life are still fresh in their mind. And they remember details because they only died a few years ago in a different body and they came back in a new body a few years later, so they still remember. They describe their names, they describe who they used to be. However, remember, as I said before, there's a small portion, less than 1% of people who remember their previous life without hypnosis. They can describe who they used to be, they can take you to the place where they used to live in a different body, they can describe the entire town. We're going to see a few examples soon about people like that that we have in our uh, days. And uh, Dr. Stevenson is bringing us flood of evidence unlimited amount of evidence, one case after the other, who leaves no doubt that reincarnation is a scientific fact. Let's give uh, one or two examples of what reincarnation is. The case of Indika Gonreta, a boy from Sri Lanka that was born in 1962, is very typical to pre previous life reincarnation phenomena. Dr. Stevenson started to investigate this case in 1968. He published his conclusion in the, in the newspaper ASPR in 1974, which means six years later. Indika, the boy, started to talk when he was two years old. About a year later, which when he was three years old, he started to describe his previous life as a very wealthy businessman from the city Matara in Sri Lanka. He remembered his mansion, his Mercedes car, his elephants, his other mansions, his chauffeur, uh, his private servant, Parmezada, and uh, also, you know, all kinds of events, all kinds of things from his previous life he described. The father of Indica Gonreta, the boy, three years old, started to check the stories of his boys. It looked to him too authentic to be uh, hallucinations. So he started to investigate if there was a person in that city before he died, a businessman, and he found out that there was a wealthy businessman who lived in Matara and is described exactly as the stories of his boy. Dr. Stevenson received the information and continued the investigation. He went to India and to Sri Lanka and confirmed many of the details that the boy Indika gave. And it, eventually they found out that he was a businessman, a trader, K.J. Verizinga, that lived in Matara and died in 1960. Now remember, the boy was born in 1962, which means two years after he passed away, God sent them back to this world in a new body, in a new city, not that far, in more or less the same culture, and now starting a new life. This is a Gentile, this is not a Jew. So we see the reincarnation concept work for Jews and for non-Jews, for every human being. There are thousands of stories like this, and Dr. Jim Tucker has gathered many of them. We're investigating cases of very young children who spontaneously begin talking about previous lives. Uh, they usually begin between the ages of two and three and, and continue until the age of five or six. Uh, we're looking at these cases to learn as much as possible about this phenomenon. Jim Tucker is preparing a research trip to meet one of his subjects. A child claiming to remember a past life. Gus Ortega is a little boy in Colorado who has talked about being his grandfather. Uh, this began when he was 18 months old, and he's made a number of statements that seem quite specific. This one uh, is a stronger case because the child has made some very specific statements that seems very unlikely he could have heard through normal means. Gus Ortega's case is only one of many. We've been studying these cases for the last 40 years. We've now collected over 2,700 cases like this. These cases have been found all over in Asia, in West Africa, they've been found in South America, in Europe, and the United States, pretty much wherever they've been looked for. In a place not quite that far away, a 
hospital in America. An old man is dying. And a young boy believes he is this man reborn. Gus Ortega is a normal six-year-old. Like most boys, he cherishes on, his time with his dad. Throw me the ball. But this relationship is different. Excellent. Gus remembers that he played with his dad in a previous life. Only then, he was the father, and his dad was his son. This is the case that UVA scientist Jim Tucker is investigating. Whenever I go to see a case, I go with a certain amount of skepticism. I never go with the assumption that this is reincarnation. And that's also the same approach that I have with, with the work as a whole. We're here because this is an interesting phenomenon, so we're trying to learn as much about it as possible. Catch it! Oh, good job! Grandpa Augie died in 1993. His son Ron found him lying on the floor in his home. A stroke. Grandpa Augie died five hours later. He was a shopkeeper. He sold everything people wanted to buy, and he loved his family. But he never met his grandson, Gus. Gus was born one year after Grandpa Augie's death. One day, when he was just a year and a half, Gus was alone in his room with his father. Ron came out and told me that he had just finished changing uh, Augie's diaper and that he, that he looked right up at him and said, you know, Dad, when I was your age, I used to change your diaper. I was flabbergasted, to be honest with you. I thought it was just kind of strange, especially the choice of words uh, to say that phrase, when I was your age, for his this little one-and-a-half-year-old toddler. He started talking about Grandpa. And, you know, just the little things he was saying um, that we knew he couldn't have known because he never met Grandpa. His grandfather died a year before he was born. So, um, yeah, we were pretty puzzled about it. Then one day, Ron Ortega brought a set of old photos home and something even more remarkable occurred. And I said, oh, look, here's a, look at this old photograph. And he came up to it and he goes, oh, there's me. I mean, I was like, just totally astounded. You know, um, it just stopped me, you know, cold. I mean, because how would he know that? <coughs> Gus would make more statements like that over the course of the next years. He would recollect episodes of his grandfather's life that even Ron could hardly remember. And he was there. Gus knew more about his grandfather than he should have. Is this evidence of reincarnation? How else can these children remember another life? The case files of Dr. Jim Tucker will yield more clues. And uh, another case that we can describe is Shanti. Shanti was born in Delhi in India in 1926. Age three, she started to tell her parents about what, what happened in the city of Motra. She claims that she has a husband. Her husband's name is Kaidernat, And she died 10 days after she gave birth to her son. When Shanti was nine years old, she started to talk non-stop about her previous life, and the descriptions of events from her previous life became brighter and clearer. Her parents sent a messenger to Motra and found out that the husband from previous life, Kai Dernat, is still alive. They sent him a letter. They told him about the stories of her daughters and her hallucinations. Kai Der was shocked from the story and decided to come and check the girl himself. One day he showed up in Delhi, surprisingly knocked on the door, 
As soon as the door was open, the little girl dis- recognized him right away and started to talk to him about cases from their previous life, from her previous life. Eventually, she was talking about food she used to cook for him and things like that. And then she asked him, how did you dare to get remarried after you promised me before I died that you'll never do it? You betrayed me. And also later, they took her to the city where she used to live in her previous life. She recognized the train station. She gave direction to the driver how to get to the house. She recognized the house even though it was uh, remodeled. She recognized every room. And then she went to the back uh, ra- background and uh, uh, to the to uh, and to a corner there, and she found she started to dig in the ground, and she she was looking for some money that she hid uh, under the ground, and he was very embarrassed because then he had to confess that he took the money after her death. So obviously, there's no question here that she was the girl who the woman who died uh, while giving birth to her boy, uh, to her boy and came back as a little girl and remember her previous life without hypnosis, which is a, a very interesting case. A, a case in Israel, an Arab Druze, which was an Israeli soldier, the Druze served in the Israeli army. Uh, his name is Bader, he's from the village of Osfia in Israel. One time when he was in training, he was about to throw a granite and he froze. Remember that he already did it once. And then he remember his previous life that a granite exploded in his play in his face. He was a shepherd with his sheep in the, in the mountains in some places in Israel. And one time he found a granite as a boy. He didn't know what it is. He pulled uh, pulled uh, uh, the safety pin out and it exploded in his face. And that's how he died. And now he's in new life. He remembered the event 100%. And then, you know, he started to tell his parents how he was shepherd. When he was, this is all when he was five years old, he already recognized his life. He remembered where he hid his flute from his previous life in a roof of some building. And he went now and found the flute who, are there, who is there from his previous life. And by the Druze is a very common phenomena that many of these kids in Israel, they remember their previous life without hypnosis. And sometimes in class, the teacher asks who remembers his previous life. There's always two or three kids from a class of 30 boys or girls that remember their previous life. This is a very high percentage of people who remember their previous life. Vivian Silvano was born in Sao Paulo in 1963. She speaks Portuguese, but all of a sudden, after a few years of her life, she started to speak parts of Italian. When she was two years old, she called her sister in the name Mia Surola, and then she had a doll, she called it Bambola. She said it in perfect Italian accent. Uh, uh, J. Leon Fleifer, a British reporter from the newspaper that checked the case, wrote about it in his book Unknown Powers, and he wrote and described details about the Italian that she speaks, she remembered her previous life, and every time a plane passed by, she hid under the table or under the bed. Later, she started to describe that she lived in Rome, in Italy. She mentioned some of, this, of the name of her friends, and she described that the world war is taking place, and the, and the planes are bombing the area, and they're all hiding. She's very scared from the bombs and from planes. And in her next life, she still has symptoms that she gets very nervous from planes who pass by. There's another case of a woman that was overweight. She cannot stop eating. She has this desire to eat non-stop. And uh, she went uh, to treat herself with hypnosis. And they take her back regression on time to try to locate where, where, where the tragedy that affecting her so much happened. And they found out that in her previous life, she was on a boat in the middle of the ocean and the boat hit a, a piece of ice and cracked and water went in and all the flour bags and the rice bags, everything became wet and they starved to death in the middle of the ocean from her previous life. And now she came back in this life and she still have this fear of dying without food and she has this impulsive habit of eating non-stop because it's a psychological problem that she carry into her next life from previous life. 
this interesting way, uh, the Israeli police found a way to catch thieves and criminals by using a parapsychologist that hypnotized victims of crimes. Uh, it's very interesting how it works because a person has conscious and subconscious. What does it mean conscious and subconscious? The important details of our life are, are stored in our conscious. The, the details that are not so critical and not so important are stored automatically in a, in a, in a subconscious in the back of our mind and are being pulled by the brain every once in a while when we need it. We'll give an example what I'm talking about. A person comes back from work, he gets off the bus and walks to his house from his bus stop and his wife is watching him from the window. Once he gets to the house, the, was, the wife asks him, tell me, can you describe to me everything that you saw while walking from the bus stop to the house? So he said to her, I have nothing else to do in my life but to stare on the floor? I don't know, I don't know, I didn't pay attention what's on the floor. She said, I've been following you for 10 minutes, you did not pick up your eyes from the floor. You saw everything on the floor and now you cannot even tell me one thing that you saw on the floor? He said, no, we're thinking about what took place at work today. I wasn't really paying attention. Five minutes later, she wants to hang a picture on the wall and she's looking for a nail all over the house and she cannot find a nail. And he said to her, hold on, let me go get you a nail. He ran downstairs, he walked a minute away from the house, and he found a nail on the floor, and he comes and he gives her the nail. So now she has a question. She asked him, five minutes ago I asked you if you can describe what you saw on the floor. You couldn't tell me anything. Now all of a sudden you remember exactly where you saw a nail? What really happened here? The answer is, when a person walks, when a person leaves, everything that happens around him is recorded automatically in his subconscious. Every beep, every car who hangs, everyone who screams on the street, music from different stores, everything is recorded. We're not paying attention to it. If you speak to us when we're unconscious, you speak to our conscious, we do not know what we just heard an hour ago. We never paid attention. But it's all recorded. There's a way to pull it out by hypnotizing the person. Hypnosis brings out what you want. You talk to the brain and the brain pulls it out. It's very interesting. So what happened is, when he did not need to know this information, he, didn't, he wasn't even aware that he recorded everything. Now when he needed the nail, the subconscious pulled it out and push it into the conscious and you realize that you just saw it and you run and get it. The Torah warned the Jew to be able always to stay holy. He has to stay holy. He has to watch his eyes, he has to watch his ears, not to hear negative things, not to see not mother's sins and things like that. The Torah told us that everything we see will affect us for eternity. We didn't understand that until we understand this concept I was talking about. Everything, even from previous lives, it's all recorded in a soul. By speaking to a soul, you get information from previous life that now on, in your conscious you're not aware. You don't even know you used to be in your previous life. But hypnotizing you, we get information from a hundred years ago. When you lived in a different body, in a different parts of the world with a different, with different language. So that's very interesting. A person is able to give information from previous life, even events in this life that he's not even aware that it happens to him. And this is what we call conscious and subconscious. So in Israel, there's a case of an old woman. She stand uh, by the sidewalk with her, with her bag and two people on a motorcycle drive by and the one who sits in the back grab her bag and steal it and they disappear and she falls on the floor and the police come and of course she didn't see anything. It was an old woman. Uh, people helped her to get up and they take her to the precinct and now the parapsychologist hypnotize her before she couldn't tell anything. She couldn't tell the plate number, she couldn't tell the color of the bike, how many people, nothing. She only heard voice of a motorcycle behind her. A minute later she was on the floor and the bag is gone. Now by hypnotizing her, she gives details which, is, which are incredible. First she know two men were sitting there. She described them. She described their clothing, she described the plate number, she described where they came from, even though it was from behind her. Everything around is recorded. And now it helps the police to discover the criminals. Obviously this is information that they were unable to know if they only speak to her when she's unconscious. 
they have to get into our subconscious and get the information. This is obviously a spiritual thing. So let's give an example of regression. In 1973, a famous doctor in Philadelphia was hypnotizing his wife. Regression. After hypnotizing her, she started to speak in a voice of a man in an ancient Swedish language. Very old language that nobody recognized. It's not what the Swedish people speak in this generation. After bringing expert who can identify the language, uh, they translate that she described herself as a farmer that lived 300 years ago in a village in Sweden called Enchian. And she described the village in the center in town, the market. She described tools, farmer's tools, that she using, remember this is 300 years ago, she did not recognize any modern equipment that the farmers use today, obviously. Just like the Amish people in Pennsylvania are using still very primitive things to keep their culture, she described things from 300 years ago in a voice of a man, in a very old language, just like it's live right now, 300 years ago. The, another case of previous life memories was uh, discovered by, in the middle of hypnosis by William McDougall, a psychologist from Harvard University. That's in the beginning of the 20th century. McDougall was an expert in hypnosis and accidentally he discovered that while he was doing research about trance, hypnotic trance, in the middle of the experiment that he was hypnotizing a guy, the guy informed him that he's an Egypt Egyptian carpenter and he was given a job to prepare an image to put in a grave of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt that lived 3,400 years ago. He described the images, an eagle with a hand, with all kinds of signs, with a white crown and symbolizing the upper worlds and the lower worlds. McDougall didn't pay so much attention to all these details, but nine months later, Sir Patry, a British archaeologist who worked with the Egyptian company in Egypt of uh, archaeologists, just found an image uh, in, in digging in the ground in Egypt of an unknown king from the pharaohs who control Egypt, and it was exactly like the description of the guy that McDougall hypnotized nine months nine month earlier. So that was discovered eventually. And this is a very, very old object. And this is very interesting how a person describes something from his previous life. Maury Bernstein uh, from Colorado, hypnotizing people, that's his specialty, published in 1956 his sensational book. The name of the book is Following Brady Mur Murphy. The book describes a woman named Ro Ruth Siemens that remember a previous life of Brady Murphy in Ireland in the 9th century. In the 19th century, it happens in the middle of regression, she started to describe relatives and historical places and speak in very heavy Irish accent. And she described all kinds of things that happened to her, you know, and everything later was published in Life magazine and American uh, newspapers uh, about the research, the search after Brady Murphy and details that was given in while uh, Maury Bernstein hypnotizer. And there's many, many other examples. Let's give one last example about this. A Swiss uh, professor named Paul Roy from Geneva University, hypnotized a little Swiss girl, five years old, that had uh, all kinds of mental problems. He tried to cure her with hypnosis, and ma as modern medicine uh, recommend. In the middle of the hypnosis, she started to describe her previous life. I'm in a palace with beautiful trees and bushes. How old are you? 23. Where are you? In Kanara in Indian. Are you married? I'm one of the wives of the Prince Sibroka, the Prince of Kanara. All that time, the Swiss girl speaking in heavy Indian accent that she never heard in her life. This is a Sanskrit ancient language that even in India nobody uses anymore. A professor 
recorded the case and sent it to world specialists for the Indian language, the ancient English Indian language and history of India and in the Calcutta University in India and they were amazed from the discovery and confirmed that there was a kingdom and a prince with that name how many years ago? Ladies and gentlemen, 500 years ago. She remembered her life from 500 years ago speaking in an ancient Indian language when now she's a Swiss girl that has nothing to do with Indian culture in this, pre in this present life. So there are many other examples and we have to conclude the case of reincarnation. There are many, many more things to say about it, but I just want everybody to understand the concept of reincarnation. As the Torah say, God wrote to us in the Torah, I'm testing you every second of your life to see, would you listen to me or not? Do you love me or not? Would you stay grateful to me or not? There's many different verses. What's the purpose of the test to reward you in your end? In the end, when you leave this world, there's a place of reward. Uh, the Torah say that uh, if you take all the pleasure of all the people of all the generations and their entire life combined, it will not reach the pleasure, the spiritual pleasure that God promised to the righteous people in the afterlife even for one hour. Which means one hour of the spiritual reward that the soul will receive in the afterlife once he goes to heaven, it's already greater than the, than the entire pleasure of all people combined. Take money, women, fame, sport, vacations, everything combined of all the billions of people who live here their entire life, a huge pile of pleasure will not reach one hour of spiritual pleasure of the soul in the afterlife for one individual. There's nothing to even compare here. How many people are going to lose this reward? Unfortunately, most of the people in the world. Most of the people in the world are complete ignorance. They have no idea what the book of God is all about. They think eh, it's beliefs, stories, the rabbis made it up. People like me and you invented it. It's an old culture, it's primitive, it doesn't apply to us anymore. All kinds of nonsense that I hear for many, many years speaking to publics all over the world. I find that the biggest danger to the life of a person is ignorance. Once a person has ignorance in any field, medicine, computers, uh, accounting, there's a price to pay. Ignorance has a, heavy, a very heavy price. But what can even come near being ignorant in the most important thing, the purpose of your life? If you have no idea what you live for, how are you going to be successful? If you don't know what your job is, you went to a factory and, they, and you're supposed to work and, you, and they never told you what your job is, can you be successful in your position when you don't know what you're supposed to do? Can you ask for direction to a destination that you don't know the address? How can you ask for direction if you don't know where you're going to? First, you have to identify where I'm aiming to go. Where do I want to end my journey? And based on that, I know how to calculate the, the, the journey itself. The conclusion of all this so far is that a person that would live here in a spiritual darkness is taking a huge risk of losing everything. And the sad part is that the same way there's a huge, amazing reward that God promised to the righteous people, Jews and non-Jews, everyone according to the difficulty of his test, there is also a major punishment. The reward is also has punishment side. It's not only reward, it's a punishment side. The Torah is full of warnings, full of threats. If you're not going to listen to me, this is the price you're going to pay. There are certain Jews that lose their share to the world to come. Every Jew is born with a share to the world to come automatically, as the Torah say. But there's a list of Jews who can lose their share to the world to come. They have a stock, they have a ticket, but they lost it. Why? Because they don't keep the covenant that God made with us. So there's a very serious price to pay. It's a shame that so many people would end up losing it just because they never read the book of God once in their life. Many people criticize the Torah or the Talmud, the Oral Torah or the Kabbalah or the, or the Book of, of the Laws and they never read it once in their life. 
They don't know what it is about. They don't know one percent from the Torah. They don't know one law from A to Z. How to how to understand that from the beginning to the end? How can you criticize some things you don't even have one one percent knowledge about it? It's just like me going to criticize a, a brain specialist who, who recommended someone to do an operation. How can I criticize him when I don't know one percent about brain? He learned all his life about brain, and he decided this is the right procedure, and I can criticize him. I'm only going to make myself look like a fool. And the world is full of fools like this, that are constantly criticizing, writing against, writing books against, using all kinds of things, doing all kinds of manipulations to confuse people not to follow the book of God, when in reality, in so many years that I deal with people, I don't remember once that someone was able to win the arguments. Every time the evidence was so clear and so powerful, Nobody had what to answer, and everybody had to admit this is the book of God. So what's the conclusion? If this is the book of God, it's a huge risk to ignore it. And this lecture, the purpose of it is to wake up some people to understand life is not ending. It's not going to be dark and you become sand like some of you may think. Then there's a price to pay or to receive, depending what you did here. In the morning ads that people put on the walls and on newspapers when a Jew died in Israel, they write Alach Leolamo, in Hebrew means went to his world. What does it mean went to his world? Went to the next world. What does it mean to his world? Everyone received his own world based on what he did over here. You prepared your eternity here, your eternity would look very good. You did not prepare, you only care about eating and, dri and driving to vacations and doing all kinds of things to make your body have physical pleasure and ignoring the rules of God, what do you expect to get? Just because you're not aware of it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I would like to finish this film with another concept that calls spiritual photography. Most of the pictures we take, one individual takes a photo of another one and later develop the pictures and you see an image. However, the eyes and the ears of the human being works in a different frequency from the animals and different frequency from all kinds of technology such as video cameras, regular digital cameras, etc. It's very interesting that some of the things that we cannot see in space, our animals, pets like dogs and cats, they can see. Many times you can sit in a quiet house in the night, quiet night, you read a book or something, and all of a sudden your dog is jumping and crying and pushing himself towards the corner and you see that he's afraid of something, he looks up and you don't see anything, he's, he behaves very strange and he sees something but you cannot see. Sometimes we take pictures, we take pictures of what we see but when we develop the picture we find other things that we couldn't see, such as other people. How can we have now extra people in a picture when they were not there when we took the picture? The answer is, this is not physical people, it's souls. As I said before, there are souls who live in space, what we call Kafa Kela. And that's a major punishment to people who live this world with big sins. And sometimes by taking a picture, the lens of the camera detects things that we didn't see with our own eyes. I would like to show now pictures who were checked by laboratories. Now remember, most of these pictures were taken way before the software of Photoshop was even exist. So obviously nobody can put pictures in such a sophisticated way, but it was still checked to make sure there's no trick here. This is authentic pictures that people took. They are, uh, you know, pictures that uh, one person takes and all of a sudden you see all kinds of spirits, what we call ghosts. Uh, the first picture is a picture in Auschwitz, uh, 1992 it was taken, uh, 20 years ago. They're taking pictures of the bathroom in Auschwitz and in the middle, as you can see, there is an image of a boy or a girl, it's hard to tell, eyes, nose, mouth, lips, clear picture of an image of a soul reincarnated there. And obviously when they took the picture, they didn't see that, but the lens of the camera was able to take. Then here is a, another picture of a captain 
a pilot that died a few days before his friends took the picture and when they developed the picture they found a friend who participated in the picture but he died a few days ago and he joined the picture and now obviously without his physical body only the spirit and it's very interesting when they developed the picture they saw him here is a picture in 1995 November 1995 a building in the in, in United States was burned Tony Orhill is a photographer who came to the place and took pictures and when he developed the picture he saw a girl in the flame in the fire which later was identified as a girl that in 1977 18 years ago she lit huge fire in some of the buildings in town and burned them and then one day she disappeared apparently she burned in one of the fires she herself set and Later, she is reincarnated in a house that is burning and was taking a picture by this photographer, Tony. It's very interesting. This is a, a usual f family pictures. And all of a sudden, when they've developed the picture, they see an image of a boy attached to a picture on the wall. The boy was not there when they took the picture, but later, obviously, the lens of the camera detects the soul of a person. This is a typical family from the 19th century, it was more than 100 years ago, in black and white, as you can see. In the siding of the building, they found a soul of their granddaughter, which was six years old when she died. She died two months before they took the picture, when the family came to take a picture. Apparently, nobody understands how. The girl is reincarnated in the siding of the house, and they recognize her 100% as you can see on the siding of the wall. This is a picture of Tracy who was born in June 13, 1975, Friday the 13th. Uh, she had a, a pneumonia and uh, all kinds of sicknesses and later she died. You know, this picture was taken in 1979 and uh, right away next, uh, before she died, right away next to her image, they found another person is standing behind there. This is an amazing thing, you know, because uh, when they took the picture, nobody was there in the room. This is the first picture that was reported digital by a digital camera, was taken by the mother of this girl in May 5th, 2001. And when, they, when she took the picture of her daughter, she found in the background another woman Half of her face is in a picture, the other half is missing, but somebody else was in a room when they took the picture. So who is the other person? Here is another person that somebody takes a picture of a girl and a man is standing right there, a spirit of another man. The camera was able to detect it. So this is, this is it. Now, one more example of pictures who people took in cemeteries taking pictures of space in, in, in cemeteries and seeing all kinds of spiritual images in space. We don't know how to explain it. But obviously when people took the picture, none of these images were, they were able to see it. The camera was able to see it, but we could not see it. Here is another picture of a girl is going to play and then there's somebody else standing right next to her. And this is a very famous case. There was a movie with the actor Ted Denson. It's called Three Men and a Baby. And while they were shooting, they filming the movie, eventually when the editor received all the shooting, he recognized that there's a boy standing there in another room behind the curtain. And he was furious, what's going on? It wasn't a part of the play. It's not supposed to be in a movie. And everyone swore that all day when they were filming, this boy wasn't there. Later, they came to the owner of the apartment who they were renting and he started to cry and confess that this is his son who killed himself with his own gun father gun the boy took the gun and shot himself in the head and his spirit is still reincarnated in the house and none of them saw him the entire day he was standing in a room when they filming this famous movie three men and a baby and later when they came and they saw the video they saw the boy the lens of the video camera was able to detect him none of the actors and the crew and that uh, shooting place, none of them saw him the entire day. This is very interesting. And many other examples of pictures we're taking and there's all kinds of images of people in, in space behind and, and after. And basically that's it. So we are now coming to the end 
of this film. We hope very much you enjoyed it. I would like to encourage every one of you to go into my website, divineinformation.com, visit my Facebook pages. There are many lectures, short lectures and long lectures. You'll be able to find approximately a thousand lectures in English and in Hebrew and in some with Russian subtitle and Turkish subtitle and others and about every subject you can think about in life. The purpose of life, the Sabbath, the eternal covenant, the correcting personality, the marriage, raising children, all kinds of challenges in life, depression, many issues, addictions, so many things. I can tell you from experience of 17 years dealing with thousands of people every year that I have thousands of emails and reports from many people who those lectures changed their entire life completely. The life was a mess and now they got on the right track. And I'm not only talking about religion, we're talking about living according to the rules of the Creator. Because Judaism is not a religion, it's a way of life. The Torah gives us all the right recommendation what to do, what not to do for our own benefits. You don't have to serve any God here. We're not worshipping anyone. We're only doing what's good for us, as the Torah repeats in few different places, I'm giving you the good and the bad, and you should choose the God for your own benefit. Not for me, you're not doing me a favor, God says. I'm perfect before you, I'll be after you. I don't need any assistance from you. I'm perfect. Perfect means 100%. None of the things you do bring me joy or depression or anything like that. God speaks to us in the Torah in a language that we understand. So sometimes use all kinds of terms like anger and sadness and things like this for us to understand what are we doing wrong or right. But that obviously doesn't mean that he has an image, a hand, a chair, none of these things. As the Torah explained, the oral Torah, make no mistake, is 100% spiritual, has no image, no size, no limitation, and is eternal. The Torah told us a big secret. I'm putting the soul in a body and I'm, I'm giving you a life full of tests challenges. Sometimes I'm torturing you. I'm strict with you. Like a father who loves his son, sometimes he's strict with him. I have patience. In the end, everything will be heard. Everything will be concluded and everyone will receive exactly what he deserves. Just because you don't see justice right now doesn't mean it won't come soon. The idea is to be intelligent and clever, continue to research, continue to check. I wish everyone to be very successful. Thank you very much for listening and watching. All the best.